Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. What you see here is a diagram I saw in my second year of graduate school. Uh, the professor showed it in a seminar on the great transitions of evolution. And he showed this slide, and I remember it captured my interest. And the reason why it captured my interest is because it encapsulated one of the great challenges in evolutionary biology, that is understanding the transition from life in water to life on land, an event that we think happened you know, in, within about you know, 375 million years ago. What you see on top is a cartoon of a lobefin fish, one of the closest cousins of limbed animals, those animals that walk on land. It's a cartoon of a fossil. Those fossils were about 390, 380 million years old. And what you see on the bottom is a cartoon of, a, of an early limbed animal, a so-called tetrapod or an amphibian to some. That's a fossil from about 365 million years old. My patch of this, starting in graduate school, was to try to find uh, a fossil that bridges this gap. And I was really lucky because uh, the rocks close to my home and my first academic job in the state of Pennsylvania, my first job was in Philadelphia in the University of Pennsylvania, the rocks close to home were the right age. They were Devonian. Uh, they were the right type. They were formed in ancient streams and, and delta systems. Challenges: they weren't exposed to the surface. But I was really lucky because the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation underwent a new road building project. And it just so happened, about an hour north of State College, Pennsylvania, they carved into some Devonian rocks from ancient delta systems in rocks about 365 million years old. If you look closely at those rock layers, you'll see channels and rivers. Okay. And inside those are preserved fossils. So pretty much as soon as we hit those rocks, we started to find fossils. And the fossils uh, we found <coughs> were of a variety of kind. We started to find limb bones of early limbed animals. This is an, a humerus or an upper arm bone. We found femora. We found portions of the shoulder, head, you name it. And through these finds and others in Pennsylvania, we were able to see what that ancient environment was in that road cut in Pennsylvania. This environment was an ancient delta system, much like the Amazon uh, Delta today, with large fish, that one in the center. Uh, is about 16 feet long, with teeth the size of railroad spikes. Now, the hunt for understanding our past and our links to it really started here for us. Because what we realized, my colleagues and I, I'm part of a team, Ted Deschler in Philadelphia, Ferris Jenkins at Harvard, what the team realized is that we needed to answer this question, to bridge the gap between fish and a tetrapod to find essentially a flat-headed fish with fins. Um, to do that, we had to go to rocks older in time. We were in here in Pennsylvania in rocks about 365 million years old. We needed, based on other discoveries in Eastern Europe and Quebec, to hit rocks about 375. This is a college geology textbook. And I was having an argument with a friend, and I discovered it in the end of this argument, this diagram, which I colored in three places. You see the United States in the center. You see Canada uh, up north. And superimposed on that is an interpretation of the depositional environments uh, in which those rocks formed. And then these authors identified, unbeknownst to me, this is in a college geology textbook, I knew nothing about this, three areas shown in red of rocks that had ancient delta systems uh, preserved in them. The first of these, ongoing Catskill project, I knew about those, so it kind of confirmed to me that they knew what they were talking about. The second one uh, is East Greenland, really well studied, that the Danes and the Swedes had worked on uh, for a number of years. Then extending 1,500 kilometers east to west across the Canadian Arctic were mapped Devonian age rocks uh, of the right age. This one's 375 million years, so 10 million years older, exactly what I wanted. They were of the right type, formed in ancient delta systems, and exposed. We had to winnow down the Arctic. It's a vast place. Bones are small. How do you go from the big place to where the fossils are found? Is you hone in on the right geological conditions. And here we were looking for a particular environment in the rocks sedimentary conditions. It took us six years uh, working in the summers, but uh, find a layer we did. Bones were on the surface. We dug in the layer, found skeleton after skeleton of bone piled on top of the other. Then my colleague Steve, who you see here on the left, pulls out a rock and says, hey, hey, Neil, what's this? See this V right here? This is everything I was looking for, and I do not exaggerate. Um, this is uh, Devonian Age rocks. This little V, see the V with a little notch in there? I looked at it, and I realized it was an upside down jaw. In here, we're teeth, and this is a snout, and it's the snout just not of any fish, but of a flat-headed fish. Remember that second slide I showed you, conical to flathead? Bammo, I had a flat-headed fish with its snout sticking right at me. 
you know, hearts raced, obviously. We uh, removed this, uh, it took three weeks. These things come back to the laboratory where the preparators, and I owe so much to them, remove the rock grain by grain over a period of months. This is Steve's specimen after four months. Okay, rock grain by grain, look, you look at it, it looks like you have a flat head, right? Another four or five months go by, it has a flat head with eyes on top. Look, it even has a neck, no, it has a neck, and the shoulder is exposing itself. So, you know, just at the time in the United States where we're having this argument over intelligent design creationism, where many people are saying there are no transitional fossils in the fossil record, you know, there's a fish on top, there's a tetrapod on bottom, there's the new fish. And this is a fish we described uh, in Pages of Nature in 2006 and 2008. We have another description of another kind of fish like this, uh, hopefully in the works. And what you can see is there's a flat head with eyes on top, like that early tetrapod. Um, but like a fish, it has scales on its back and fins with fin rays, fin webbing. But like a land-living animal, it has a neck, flat head, and indeed when you open up the fins, you see it has bones that correspond to upper arm, forearm, uh, even parts uh, of a wrist. You know, I, could spend, you know, I could spend two hours talking about how wonderful it is to understand the t transition from life on water to life on land. This creature had lungs and gills and so forth. But the real story is the universe within and the inner fish. And the real story that pertains to us is that this transition from life in water to life on land is an important event in the past, but it's made more important by the fact that it's part of our own past when our common ancestors were fish. That is, many of the structures we see appearing for the first time in this creature, Tiktaalik, uh, and its evolutionary cousins are part of our own bodies. That neck we see for the first time in these creatures is something that was to become our own neck. The proto-wrist we see of appearing for the first time uh, in Tiktaalik and its evolutionary cousins is something that was to become our own wrist, and bone and bone and system after system. And how do we know that? We know that through evidence. We know this through connecting the structures in our arm to the bones in Tiktaalik. It has an arm bone with one bone, two bones, and so forth, much like all land-living animals. We know that by connecting the bones in our head. And the lines of evidence are many. They are the fossils, which you see sort of in, in schematic form here. But we also have embryology, where we compare the embryos of creatures alive today, as well as developmental genetics, where we can compare the regulatory genes or the patches of DNA that drive the developmental processes. We are connected to the rest of the life on our planet, and indeed, Tiktaalik is just one stopping point. If we look at ourselves and we see the layer after layer of history inside of us, we can connect ourselves first to our primate past, then to our mammal past, our reptile past, our amphibian past, our fish past, all the way to microbes. Layer after layer of over three billion years of history lies in every organ, cell, and gene in our body, and that history is noble through the evidence that we find. But that is just the tip of the iceberg, indeed. And the iceberg is also part of our history because we can uh, trace our history all the way back to the Big Bang, at least the components that make us, the organs and how they're shaped in us. And we can take a tour from the deepest events uh, in our universe to the formation of our planet and so forth. The Big Bang of 13.7, 13.6 or so billion years ago is obviously the beginning of the expansion and cooling of the universe. But we could trace parts of ourselves, much of our constituents, to the moments after the Big Bang, to the formation of the Earth and the formation of the Moon that influenced our branch of the tree of life and influenced all life itself, to changes in the atmosphere that happened billions of years ago, to the actual workings of the planet itself, which influenced our own evolution. I don't have time to talk about you know, those billions of years of history. I want to take two stopping points, just to give you things that, um, that uh, hopefully uh, you haven't thought of uh, before. Maybe thought about them in a different way, but this maybe gives you a different perspective. Our solar system uh, formed as a disk around the sun over 4.6 billion years ago. That event and the sort of interactions that came about from that event are embedded in every part of our body, deeply inside of us, including the workings of our DNA. How do we know that? Well, one narrative begins uh, with this uh, gentleman here, Michel Cifre, a French geologist. He came up with a, an idea for a fabulous experiment. This is in the early 60s. And this experiment was essentially um, to live in a cave for uh, two months with no clock, no time, no sense of time. How time dependent are we as a species was his question. So what he did, being a meticulous note taker, he attached himself to all kinds of devices for what was planned to be two months, took notes about when he went to sleep and when he woke up, uh, when he ate, he's French, he, he's libido and all that good stuff. He gets out of the cave after two months, totally blown away, he had no idea what time, he thought he, he lost 22 days. His, his perception of time was completely disconnected from reality. Here's the important point, but his body was not disconnected from reality. His body clock was functioning on a veritable 24-hour cycle. And we now know that, uh, in the years since Sif, is that we have 
deeply embedded in us, a deep tie to a clock. Our highest alcohol tolerance is, uh, is around 9 o'clock at night. Well, probably all know that. Lowest alcohol tolerance is in the morning, so you bang per buck is at breakfast. Um, <laughs> bowels and kidneys are suppressed in the evening, which is great if you live in a sleeping bag in the Arctic. And, you know, you can see in the layer after layer of clocks. And indeed, m most of our biology is related to a clock-like function inside of us of our DNA and proteins. And how do we know that? Well, one of the great breakthroughs here happened right after Seif's adventure in the cave through studying flies. One of the great labs in the 60s for this was uh, the laboratory in Caltech of Seymour Benzer. Uh, Benzer was a remarkable scientist, and they studied all kinds of mutants. One of his graduate students found an amazing mutant. Found a mutant where the flies had an altered rest activity cycle. And uh, they found that this one was shifted. So he bred it true, and it turns out there was a genetic basis for that shift in the rest activity cycle. That was a breakthrough, because now knowing the gene, it gave other people tools to find other genes that it interacts with or the proteins that those genes make, and how those proteins work together, and the whole intricate mechanism of these things. And over the last several decades, scientists have been working on this mechanism, and they've uncovered a molecular clock that's written in the activity of DNA. What we have is inside our cells, as well as these flies, a clock, where the activity of DNA and proteins goes, rises and falls during the course of a 24-hour cycle. And it happens because of a form of a molecular pendulum. DNA makes proteins, those proteins interact with the DNA itself and downregulate the DNA. So think about a pendulum. So activity and inactivity of the DNA is based on a kind of molecular pendulum with many genes and many proteins. And so powerful is this is that it explains some of our own mutants. You know, we all know people who are night owls or larks. Some of us stay up late and get up late. They're called college students. The ones who, uh, uh, who uh, get up early and go to bed early, that's kind of me. Um, there are some people who have mutants of this. Uh, in humans, there's this thing called advanced sleep phase syndrome, uh, where individuals who have it can't stay up past 7 or 7.30 at night um, and get up around 3 or 4 in the morning. That, they've studied this gene that causes this in, in Utah, and they found there's actually a simple a genetic basis for it, a change in the, what's called the phosphorylation of the DNA of a particular gene. Turns out that that genetic shift is similar to one that causes an altered rest activity cycle in hamsters, which is similar to one that causes an altered rest activity cycle in flies. Inside each of us, inside of all animals, indeed all creatures that interact uh, with the planet, we have a tie to the spinning of the Earth and its connection to the moon. Because the 24-hour day is the property of the spinning of the Earth, which is in part related to our interaction through energetic reactions and angular momentum uh, with the rotation of the moon. The solar system itself is embedded, and our interactions with the solar system is embedded deeply in our biology. We know that the variation of the orbit of our changes, of the Earth changes over time. That is, if we look at the Earth, it, the or shape of our orbit varies, the wobble and tilt of our planet varies on a cycle of tens or hundreds of thousands of years. Some of these cycles relate to major climate changes in the planet, such that they interact, these cycles, which happen every you know, 100,000, 40,000, 20,000 years. Some of these cycles occasionally interact produ pr to produce periods of glaciation, of the retreat and fall of the ice from high and low latitudes. Indeed, this glaciation, the retreat and fall of ice, which is itself related in part to the, uh, the various changes in the orbit of the Earth, has been a major factor influencing human evolution uh, and human history itself. So these factors, which have been central to the evolution of our species in East Africa, as well as human history since then, are related to variation of changes in the Earth's orbit, which, by the way, themselves are related to the interaction of our planet's orbit with the orbit of the largest planet of our solar system, Jupiter. So in a very real sense, this, the, ends, uh, the ends of this chain of logic seem so utterly bizarre, but if you follow each chain, part of the chain, it makes total sense, and there's evidence to support it, that our history, our human biology, has been influenced by glaciation, which has been influenced by changes in the Earth's orbit, which is itself is influenced by interactions uh, in the solar system itself. And story after story emerges when we look at the world this way. So much so that, you know, it's useful to ask is, what has science done for us <laughs> in the last 500 years or so? How has it changed our perception of our place in nature, in the cosmos, and so forth? You, know, you think about what Copernicus did. You know, he booted our planet from the center of the solar system, right? He put the sun at the center of the solar system. We rotate around the sun. So our special perch was, was removed in an important way. Think about what Darwin and the biologists did too. They had their say here as well. We're no longer specially created. We're special in a lot of ways compared to other animals. But we're not a special animal in the sense that we are deeply connected to other creatures. We're part of a tree of life that contains billions of other species. We're one twig on this vast uh, tree of life which contains 
creatures of every description and, uh, and, and function as well. But just as Darwin and Copernicus, as the biological scientists and the physical scientists, have removed us from our special perch, they've done something else. They've connected us to the rest of life, connected us to the rest of the planet, and connected us to the cosmos beyond. To me, that's a very profound gift. Thank you very much. One thing that hits me, uh, Neil, in your account is uh, discovery is a really important part of your story. There was something missing, and you knew it was missing, and so you went to find it. Other bits of discovery are entirely fortuitous. People are looking for one thing, and something completely different comes mm. along. Also, in your story, collaboration is an important part of that. So what has it kind of taught you about how discovery happens in science? Well, discovery, to me, and that's a big part of the book, but it's also a huge part of my own life, um, comes about because human knowledge is ever-growing and tentative. I believe that as we, sh we, we propose ideas, and our job as scientists is to refine those ideas, sometimes falsify them, but hopefully improve them. And what does that is discovery. And that process of trial and error and learning from mistakes is one where I discover about so many things. I discover about geology, because I'm homing in. I'm discovering about uh, biology. I discover about myself. You know, there's a human element to this too. You know, when to give up, when not to give up, uh, frustration. You know, personal challenges and so, teamwork, collaboration. So that, as well. I mean, I suppose I, I, I get, get from this is that when scientists make a new discovery, it's not so much that what they're handing to the rest of the scientific community is a discovery; is what they're handing to them is a new set of questions, which That's are opened up by that discovery. You hit it exactly right. You know, what we do as scientists is and is is generate ever more powerful and refined questions. I'm a failure as much as I'm a success, if not more. I mean, uh, because that's the part of discovery. I go to the art. We're doing a whole new gig in the Arctic this summer, in a new place, in a new time period. I don't expect to have a lot to show for myself in terms of fossils, but I will have new ideas and new questions. And it, it's a process that will take us time uh, to get there. So that, that points to the importance of blue sky research, because in a oh, sense, you, bet. It, oh, you have to fund research. If you only fund research which is close to finding a discovery, you're not going to fund stuff which, uh, of your kind. It still I takes six years. I would be completely... I, I wouldn't be sitting here across from you today if it wasn't for some, somebody or an institution that funded a crazy idea in 1998. I had nothing, it was a, literally a fishing expedition. I mean, <laughs> but I mean, it was, it was an idea. I had nothing to show for myself except for a geological map, one of which I showed you. There were some reform, more reformed, uh, refined maps that were produced by the Canadian government. I had satellite photos. But it was all that, you know, it wasn't anything tangible. One of the things I was thinking as I was listening to you is we're not going to be around for much longer, you know, in the grand sweep of, of, of things, you know. And that now we, we kind of fight and we say, well, we worry about climate change. Do you have a kind of philosophical view which says, well, you know, I kind of realize that all my work and all of this, will, well, sooner or later it will crumble because that's just the way things happen in the, in the grand sweep of time. Well, I think crumbling is probably the wrong word. I hopefully won't crumble. Um, but, um, you know, when you're a paleontologist, you learn that every species has a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? The only difference is how, what's the, what's the separation in time between the beginning and the end. Every species goes extinct. Um, every species has its, uh, has its time on Earth, just like every individual has its time on Earth. But they leave descendants. They impact each of those species. Each individual, I don't want to be too karmic about it, but leaves an impact on the planet. And other, we all have an impact on people, our children, our colleagues, our friends. Uh, our society at large, hopefully. Our species has an impact on well, our species in particular, but each species has an impact on the planet itself and the other species that are connected to that. So uh, indeed, you know, we will all leave our mark. Hopefully it won't be a crumble. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm a little more optimistic than that. It just remains for me to uh, ask you to join me in thanking Neil Shubin.